So, but this is one of the provocatively challenging verses in the Gita. Why? Because there seems to be a, such an obvious mismatch between the walk and the talk. Like somebody tells, you know, no, you should not eat fatty foods. It's not good for your health. And then you see them at the meal. They are just gorging on fatty foods. She says, what happened? Oh, that is a you rule, not a me rule. <laughs> Now, if somebody acts like that, he says, what kind of person is this? We would not be very inspired. We would be annoyed, if not alienated from such a person. So, here Krishna is saying, I am equal to everyone. But this Gita verse is being spoken on a battlefield. And in a battlefield, there are clearly two sides. And Krishna is on one side. Krishna is supporting one side. And in effect, he is opposing the other side. Krishna may not have, uh, be taking up weapons for the fight, but Krishna is clearly choosing one side. So if he is choosing one side, then how is he equal to everyone? And, and if it's so clear that he's partial, he's favoring one side, how can he make such a claim that I'm equal to everyone? So to understand this, I'll talk about this at three levels. First is, we'll talk about what equality actually means. Hmm. Then we'll talk about how it applies to the Kurukshetra battlefield setting. And then lastly, we'll see how we can see equality in God's actions in our life, in the lives of our people around us. When we see so much inequality and iniquity, apparently. So first, let's begin with, when we need to get a deeper understanding of equality. So, if we, if we equality, re-envision it. So, there are broadly two kinds of equality. Where there is literal equality. Where everybody is treated identically. And then there is effective inequality. Effect, sorry, not equality, effective equality. What it means is, we treat everyone in such a way that it has a similar positive effect on them of helping them grow or whatever the positive effect that is intended. So let's understand the difference between these two equalities. Say, a mother has two children. A mother is training two children. And one of them is just a small sibling is growing up. And the mother is training the child. So when you eat food, don't spill food on your clothes, on the table, eat carefully so that there's no mess. And the other sibling is older. And for that older sibling, maybe this older sibling now has to go to, go to college and go to stay somewhere else and uh, he or she needs to learn cooking and cleaning. The mother tells when you're cooking, don't spill food around the kitchen. When you're cleaning, don't spill all the waste eatables all around the sink. But she's training a child. You know, Older sibling in avoiding a spilling while cooking and cleaning. Now both of them sit down. Maybe the stronger sibling is around what? Four, three, four years old. The older sibling is 13, 14 years old. And both of them eat their food. And neither of them spills a single morsel of food. The mother, oh, well, the three, four years old, oh, so nice, well done. And the older sibling says, why are you discriminating against me? No, you are appreciating her, her so much and you are not appreciating me at all. Now, is that discrimination? Well, in one sense, if we, we think of equality as literal equality, then yes, that's discrimination. But it's not because they are at two different levels. And equality means the mother treats both the children equally in a way that both are encouraged to grow from where they are. Mm -hmm. So, if the, the, so, the, so the point here is that equality is not as simple as it seems. And if a mother is to be responsible, 
Now, should she be literally equal or effectively equal? Effectively, effectively equal. You know, and the, it is the sibling who has to, the older sibling has to be mature enough to understand my mother is not being partial. My mother is not actually displeased with me or uh, disfavoring me in any way. Isn't it? So, what happens is when you have siblings, you become very good at math. Why? Because you count quarters very carefully. Now, who gets how much quarters of what? Is it? <laughs> so, there is that calculative comparative mentality. Oh, doesn't the parents love this, this child, me more? Or younger sibling, older sibling? That's natural to some extent. But, you know, everything natural is not necessarily desirable. So there may be natural comparative tendency, but that comparative tendency has to be subordinated with our intelligence. So there is literal equality and there is effective equality. And Krishna says, I am equal to everyone. His equality is in terms of effective. How can he be effective constructively for everyone's growth? So the, if we see the law treats everyone equally, or at least it should treat everyone equally. But does that mean that it has it will treat everyone identically? No, even if two people have committed the same crime and both of them are before a judge, what will happen is the judge will consider the past track record. If for somebody this is the first time crime committed circumstantially because of maybe some unexpected circumstances, then what happens is then the the judge may give a little lighter sentence. But if somebody is a repeat offender and they are just completely brazen about having committed some wrong. If somebody is say a traffic cop pulls somebody over for speeding for the first time, says I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you know, uh, you know I had an uh, emergency at work, my parents are sick or whatever and they are in the hospital and I was rushing, my mother is sick. Okay, it's the first time, let it go. But some people are just brazen. Ah, they just keep speeding repeatedly. Once a traffic cop pulled over a person. And he asked the person, did you see the speed limit? He said, I saw the speed limit, I just didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> so now, most people will not be so brazen as to say that to the traffic cop. But that's what they'll be thinking. <laughs> So if I see you, I will slow down. But the idea is, if somebody is that brazen, hmm, that way they don't think that doing anything wrong is the problem. Just getting caught is the problem. And they keep doing it again and again. And they think if I'm just clever enough to get away. So they, uh, then, then the whole thing is fine. Then if somebody is a repeat offender, then the law will treat them differently. The judge may give a harsher sentence for the same infringement, hmm, for the same transgression. That's why equality is an important virtue. But at the same time, how equality is implemented in real life is often complex. And things are not always as they seem to be. I discussed two examples in parenting and in law. That equal what may seem apparently unequal may not be actually unequal. In fact, we could say one of the characteristics of knowledge, knowledge in not in terms of this information, but knowledge in terms of wisdom, is that knowledge enables us to see more than what our eyes can see. I'll repeat this. Knowledge enables us to see more than what our eyes can see. If somebody is medically trained, then let me look at a particular person, say for example, you now you see somebody has very pale nails. Say, hey, this person might be having anemia. Now anybody else will say, okay, your nails are so pale. That's all, that's just your... They will not think anything beyond it. So what happens is, in various areas of life, uh, if our car is not working, for us it's just that the car is not working. But somebody mechanic who comes there, 
They say, okay, there we are, the spark plug is gone. Okay, so knowledge enables us to see more than what our eyes can see. Krishna calls this in the Bhagavad Gita as Jnana Chakshu, in 15.10. Chakshu is eyes, Jnana is knowledge. The eyes of knowledge. So the Bhagavad Gita gives us the eyes of knowledge to understand how God acts in the world. And to therefore we can see how God is equal to everyone, how God is benevolently disposed toward everyone. Even when there seems to be apparent inequality in his treatment. So the first point was this that equality re-envisioned. A deeper understanding of equality. Now second point I'll discuss is how this concept of equality can be understood in the historical setting of the Kurukshetra war. And then third I'll discuss how we understand it in our lives. Any questions at this point? Okay. At any time during the class, feel free to ask questions. And I will feel free to not answer them. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is that if I think the question is not immediately relevant to the context, or if I'll be answered later part of the question, I may not answer it that time. But I'll answer it eventually. Yes, please. What is the uh, small difference between the knowledge? Knowledge and okay, what is the difference between knowledge and wisdom? See, it depends on how words are defined. In Sanskrit, there is Jnana, which is usually translated as knowledge. And then there is Vidyana. So Vidyana, in general terms, it is translated as science. In spiritual circles, Vidyana is translated as realized knowledge or realization. Jnanam te hamsa vidyana idam vaksham he says, Jnana and Vijnana differentiates and he says, Jnana, Vijnana, Trupta, Atma. He says, when you have knowledge and when you have realization, that is, that is, uh, when we can become contented, our heart becomes fulfilled. So we could say, uh, in terms of that differentiation, knowledge is, uh, knowledge can be more informational or theoretical, whereas wisdom is more internalized. It is more a resource that we can apply in life. Say for all of if we come to the English language. Now all of us have a certain level of vocabulary. But our vocabulary often falls in two levels. That there is, there is active vocabulary and there is dormant vocabulary. Active vocabulary refers to the words that we regularly use. And sometimes we want to use a particular word. Oh, this, sometimes what happens is we overuse certain words. Like as devotees, maybe you overuse the word wonderful. The class was wonderful. The prasad was wonderful. The kirtan was wonderful. Devotees are wonderful. Krishna culture is wonderful. After some time, the word wonderful is so overused that it becomes meaningless. So what happens is sometimes you say, what, what do you use some different word? Oh, the class was insightful. The prasad was delicious. The kirtan was electrifying. Uh, devotees are so encouraging, so warm. We could use different adjectives. So sometimes we want to use a particular word, but we just don't get that word. That. And then somebody else uses the yeah, that was the word I was looking for. So what that means is that word is in our dormant vocabulary, not our active vocabulary. We know the word, but we just don't know it enough to use it when we need it. So what is active is so what is easily available for us, what we readily use, that is active vocabulary. What we know but can't access, that is more of dormant vocabulary. So we could say similarly, knowledge is the information that we, uh, we could say, okay, in terms of this, there is knowledge that we know but we rarely use it, we rarely apply it. There is so much philosophical knowledge that we remember when we are teaching others. <laughs> but when it comes to applying ourselves, it seems like that knowledge goes and hides somewhere in our brain and we just can't access it. So, so when that so we could say wisdom is like our active vocabulary, is like our active knowledge. Whereas, uh, whereas knowledge in general, which can be called a theoretical knowledge, a non-realized knowledge. That is just information that we have, but we have not yet realized it. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Okay. Yes, we have a question. Um, in the context of this course, give us a The question says, as a surrender unto me, I reward him accordingly. So it's, it's, there's no question of equal to all here. So in this course, 929, question says, I'm equal to all. But here, in think some, some part one, you see that I'm on the board, as a surrender unto me, I reward him accordingly. So it's kind of a little contrary to these two courses. Can you explain this? Yes, you are stealing my future points. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So there is the principle of equality which is mentioned in this verse and later on Krishna mentioned the principle of reciprocity. Reciprocity means, Krishna says, that all people approach me, I reward them accordingly. So we will discuss that principle, in fact that is the next principle I was going to discuss in the Kamal Kurukshetra war. Okay. So now let's look at it, uh, if you want to analyze equality, I mentioned this. So. As it appears that Krishna is partial because he is on Arjuna's side and not on Duryodhana's side, on the Pandava side or the Kaurava side. But is that really partiality? Let's try to understand it. So, first thing is that divine equality cannot be, be the same as divine passivity. What do you mean by divine passivity? To that, okay. If, because I can't see what is there. So, if what I am speaking is not being reflected there, please tell me. Mm -hmm. I have not yet developed the Siddhi to see behind my head. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if we say God is equal to all, does that mean he is forever forbidden to take any sides in any conflict? That would receive God to a cipher, to somebody uh, insignificant. It's like the police are meant to be equal to all. But if they are rioters, killing, attacking and vandalizing and even killing innocent people and the police say we are equal to all. So the police say we can't take side of the one side. There is a conflict over there. Let it go on. That is not equality. So, so we can't say that equality is passivity. So God is not meant to be a cipher, a zero, an insignificant person who can't do anything in the name of equality. So what does it? So what does God's equality mean? There is two things. There is universal responsibility, and there is proportionate reciprocity. Universal responsibility means pitaham asya jagato. Krishna says, "I am the parent of all living beings, and thus He takes responsibility for everyone." But at the same time, there is proportionate reciprocity. So if you can give a parenting example. The parents may love all their children, that they are multiple children, uh, but at the same time, say if one child is, is uh, profligate, is prodigal, just wastes money, and the other child is quite responsible about uh, and frugal about using money. Now the parents may not necessarily give, give the key to their treasury at home or to the port for their bank account. To the child who is who is profligate, who is wasteful. Now, are they being uh, partial over there? Not necessarily. They are being reciprocal. So, so Krishna resides in everyone's heart as the Paramatma. He wants to guide everyone. Sarvasya Chaham. Riddhi Sanji Vishno, he is in the hearts of every single living being. And he doesn't discriminate over there. You know that. Oh, you are so irresponsible, you are so immoral, you are so anti spiritual. I am disgusted with you. I leave your heart and go away. Krishna never does that. Krishna never abandons anyone. In fact, we can say that. that there is nothing that anyone can ever do that will stop Krishna from loving them. There is not, we don't have the power to do anything that will make Krishna say, I don't love you, I hate you. That is never going to happen. So in that sense, Krishna loves everyone. 
He cares for everyone. He's responsible for everyone. And thus, he he is equal. He's, that is his universal responsibility. So, his presence in the heart is independent of our behavior. But at the same time, there is reciprocity. He connects more with those who want to connect further with him. And he stays more silent with those who want God to be silent. Why? Because if that's what want, Krishna, they want, Krishna respects their faith. So, so reciprocity is also a sign of Krishna's personal nature. You know, suppose, say we meet someone in the temple or we meet someone in a get-together, a party or whatever, we want to talk with them. And then, whoever comes to talk with them, they just have that same stolid face. Somebody praises them, somebody criticizes them. The same stolid, unmoved face. You see no emotion at all. You now we may appreciate how impassive they are, how, how, how stolid are they are. See, in English there are some words which have certain peculiar meanings. There is passive and there is impassive. Now, impassive is not the opposite of passive. Um, passive is inactive. Impassive is emotionally inactive. Because impassive means a person shows no emotions at all. It's completely stolid. We may appreciate how how stolid they are, but it will be very difficult to develop any relationship with them. You know, are you pleased with what I'm saying? Are you angry with what I'm saying? Are you upset? You know, if you just there's no reciprocation, well, how do you connect with such a person? It, it's very difficult. Isn't it? So Krishna is not just a principle, Krishna is a person and therefore he reciprocates. So his reciprocity is also a part of his equality. So we could say, he's, if you want to put it, is he partial? Well, yes, he is partial, but he is equally partial. <laughs> what do you mean equally partial? He says that I will give special attention to those who give special attention to me. But he gives everybody the opportunity to give special attention to him. He gives every opportunity to connect with him and become his devotees. So in that sense, it's like, suppose there's a millionaire or a billionaire and they live in a particular locality. And if there is any problem in that locality, they give profuse charity to the person over there. Now they may say that, oh, you don't give charity to everyone. Hmm? But they say, everyone is come, welcome to come and live in this locality and I'll give you charity. So, they are in one sense partial, but they are not partial also because they are giving charity to everyone. They are not discriminating based on you know which race you are, which, which religion you are, whatever. And they are charity to everyone, but in this locality, nobody is infinite, having infinite, having, having infinite resources. So, in their case that may be understood that way. But the point is, Krishna says, if you connect with me, now here connecting with him is, you are growing spiritually, you are becoming more responsible then I'll connect more with you. Parents may love everyone, love all their children. But this, we could say this reciprocity is also a sign of trust. Now, what do you think is the difference between love and trust? First of all, do you think love and trust are the same things? No? Okay. How many of you think love and trust are different? Some of you don't trust me to get the answer. <laughs> okay. Okay, some of you think that love and trust are different. How many of you think love and trust are the same? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, fine. Let's let's explore this a little bit. So those who say that love and trust are different, can you say how they are different? Yes. Um I can't like uh Say you have a manager, you trust your manager to give you like a paycheck every week. You trust your manager to like give you the instruction to do your job correctly. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you love your manager because you're not necessarily close to them. But like your parents, you love them, so you automatically trust them. Like you can love somebody and trust them, but it doesn't it doesn't mean that you love everybody you trust. So I guess just because you put trust in people that you don't necessarily love. So That's a good example. Yeah, so we may trust someone, but you don't necessarily love them. If we are going uh, to get a surgery, 
And we are literally trust, entrusting our life in the hands of the surgeon. Isn't it? But that doesn't mean we have fallen in love with the surgeon. Isn't it? So there can be trust without love. Hmm. Now, convert, that's one way of differentiating. Nice, thank you. Yes, Prun? Yeah, I was thinking about mother's love and a soldier's trust in his, in his commanding officer. So, a mother's love is always there regardless of whether the child listens to her or not, or may not believe her and all of that. But a soldier's trust in, the, in his commanding officer is because they have been trained to do it. And if the commanding officer lets him down, he will be shocked or you know, he will be like, he will not believe it or whatever. But a mother will never think like that, even if the child has listened to her. That's, that's okay. So you're thinking that saying love is conditional. So love is unconditional. Whereas trust is somewhat conditional. We may trust someone, but if they betray our trust, then we may stop trusting them. That, that's true also. Now any one more answer you would like to give? Yes. Uh, one more common example is that we love our child but we cannot trust them to our parties. <laughs> Don't tell your children that. <laughs> so we love our children, but we don't trust our children. Yes, you know, it, there is a stage. There is, there is love. One part of love is not trusting, in, in the sense that if there is a small child, and then if uh, you give the child, let the child play with a knife. I trust you. But the child even doesn't know what is the knife, and a child. Uh, a child cuts himself or herself up, and then the parents say, I trust you, the child. And then the, the child protection service will come, we don't trust you anymore now as a parent. <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes a part of love, an essential expression of love is withholding trust. That doesn't mean there is no love. So, on one side there can be trust without love, and there can be love without trust also. So, in terms of a growth in the relationship, a deeper relationship is where there is both love and trust. That's when the relationship is very deep. So, when the child has grown up, the child has become more responsible, has shown a track record of responsibility, then the parents can say, hey, you know, when I'm not there, you can take care of the house and you can take care of your younger siblings also. So, there's a greater level of intimacy when there is both love and trust. So why I am talking about this differentiation is that Krishna loves everyone. On the battlefield, Krishna loves the Pandavas and Krishna loves the Kauravas. He cares for both of them. But the difference is that they, he doesn't trust both of them. Because both of their past actions have been different. In fact, in some ways we can say that Krishna offered love more to the more to Duryodhana than to the Arjuna or even Yudhishthira. How? Because Krishna went as a peace messenger to try to uh, petition for peace. Sometimes some people feel when they hear about the Bhagavad Gita for the first time, they feel a little disturbed that oh, there is there is this peace loving Arjuna who doesn't want to fight. And this God who is inciting him to fight. <laughs> now, what kind of God is this? And what kind of religious book is this? It can be very disconcerting. However, the Gita is much, much deeper than this. It's not that Arjuna is specifically peace loving. Arjuna is a warrior. He's been trained to fight. It's like when the United Nations find that there is some violence, some insurgent group is killing innocent people or between. And two people are, two groups of people are fighting and innocent people are being killed in between. Then the United Nations may send a uh, peacekeeping, what do you call it, peacekeeping? Force, isn't it? So you want peace, but you need force to keep peace. So sometimes uh, violence is the only way to stop violence. But that is not the best way all the time, and that should certainly not the first way. But sometimes that's what is required. So Arjuna was a Kshatriya like that and it was not that Arjuna didn't, Arjuna was peace loving, he knew that sometimes fighting is required but in this case he was not sure whether the fighting was the right thing to do and if Krishna's purpose had been just to get Arjuna to fight and Krishna could have done that very easily. You know when some people want to 
uh, to incite violence, get people, get a mob to attack and to uh, do arson and to go on a rampage. What is the easiest way to incite somebody to become aggressive? Anger. anger them. How do we anger them? That's true. Well, okay, we don't want them to angry, be angry with us. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want them to attack us. It's true. But, uh, yeah. Remember what they did, it drove pretty, And just remind them of something that the other side did. Yes, no, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like generally when somebody wants to, uh, when some, some self interested political leaders want to incite a mob and go and do some ethnic cleansing or some kind of violence against a particular group, what they do is demonize the other group. You know, see, they did this and they did that and they did that. How terrible they are. They des deserve to be destroyed. So, what happens in such a case is that there is this word hate speech. Sometimes this portray exagger portray the other people negatively by exaggeration, by distortion of fact, by disinformation. So what now in this case, what happens is in the case of the Kauravas, Arjuna Krishna didn't have to do any disinformation or misinformation. So disinformation is when somebody speaks something false. Uh, misinformation is when somebody reports something false because they don't know it is false. There are different ways to understand it. But the idea is somebody knows something is false, so they propagate it because they want a particular effect. That's disinformation. But the idea is Krishna didn't have to use any disinformation or misinformation or anything like that. As he said, that the Kauravas had actually done terrible things. But they had tried to publicly disrobe Arjuna's wife, Draupadi. Any ordinary person would get angry if their family member were dishonored. Not to speak of Arjuna, he's a trained warrior. Arjuna was a fearless warrior and a peerless warrior. He was quite competent to punish the Kauravas. But it is remarkable that in the entire Bhagavad Gita, not once does Krishna mention about the insult of Draupadi. Not once does he mention anything about any of the atrocities committed by the Kauravas. Why is that? If Krishna's purpose had been to incite Arjuna to fight, this is a easy way. Just he's not even distorting it, just report, reminding of the reality. So it's like if you can eat food like this, why eat like uh, why eat like this? So if Krishna's purpose has been to get Arjuna to fight, why is he going all this way? And that is because Krishna's purpose is not, not simply to get Arjuna to fight. Krishna's purpose is to expand Arjuna's worldview of what is happening. Ultimately, Krishna's purpose is to inspire Arjuna to harmonize with the divine will. To take responsibility in God's plan for the good of the world. And that is why at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, Arjuna doesn't say, I will fight. In 1873, Arjuna says, I will do your will. So the Bhagavad Gita is a book for this. It is a book meant to inspire all of us to become instruments of God's compassion. To do our part in making the world a better place. That is so we could say if a pendulum is there, one is that the Gita is a book of violence. And that, that is what the first impression some people might get on seeing the context of the Gita. And there is one at least one prominent uh, Indian spiritual leader who said actually it's the opposite. The Gita is the book of non-violence or you can say silence. But the Gita is not neither a book of violence nor of silence. The Gita is a book of transcendence. Transcendence. Transcend the normal worldly motives for acting and see from a higher perspective. You know, how can I serve God? How can I act in a way to make things better in a mood of service to God in this situation? So that is the conclusion of the Gita. That is the purpose of the Gita. So I am talking about this is God is a plan for the betterment of the world. And 
the Pandavas are ready to assist in that plan. Like say, uh, if there is a national emergency, say there is a pandemic, and now the government wants to offer some relief, maybe uh, send send some information, provide some masks, provide some emergency relief food to those who are in need. And some people become volunteers and they say we will help. And then there are people who are the opposite of volunteers. They are disruptors. You know, they are just spreading rumors. They are uh, they are they are maybe they are sick and still they are going around and they are spreading the vaccine to others. Now what happens is from the government's perspective, both of them are citizens. But one is helping make the things better, the other is making things worse. Because actually the government will treat people differently. So in one sense we can say that if you re-envision the Kurukshetra, it is not that, that this is not simply a war between two human two human parties, between two political fighters. This is a war where Krishna wants to establish a virtuous order in the world and Duryodhana is obstructing Krishna's purpose, where Arjuna is assisting in that purpose. So we can say, Krishna hasn't taken Arjuna's side, Arjuna has taken Krishna's side. Mm -hmm. It is not that Krishna is partial, Krishna is very clear, this is my mission. I want to benefit everyone. And Arjuna is assisting Krishna in that. Whereas, Krishna is not on the side opposite, of, opposite to Duryodhana, it is Duryodhana who has taken the side opposite to Krishna. Now Krishna, as I said, let me just complete this one. So Krishna is himself, and we went to Duryodhana, to petition for peace. And what did Duryodhana do? Does anyone remember what was Duryodhana's reply? Yeah, sorry. Who is that? Yeah, I will not give enough land to put even the tip of a needle through. Then what does this mean? You just went with this nice dialogue. But actually if you think about it, the implication, it's, it's quite great. Sometimes we invite someone for a program and they don't want to come, so they make an excuse. Now they are making an excuse, we know that they are making an excuse, and they know that we know that they are making an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> but at least they are polite enough to try to make an excuse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as one devotee is very sharp. So he, he invited somebody for a program and that person tried to make an excuse and he said, you know, you know at least don't, don't insult my intelligence by making an excuse that I know is false. <laughs> make a more believable excuse. So anyway, so, so at least there is some amount of courtesy in trying to make an excuse. We invite, but in contrast, if we invite somebody for a program and they say, even if I die, my dead body will never come to your program. <laughs> <laughs> this is not just saying no to the invitation. This is like punching the person in the face. So this is Duryodhana's attitude. When he is saying that I will not give even one particle of land, he is just punching Krishna in the face. Or you can say even kicking Krishna in the face. So, and what has happened is so Duryodhana is not just against Krishna's purpose. Duryodhana is acting in a self-destructive way. He is acting in a way that will create a very dark future for himself. That when we do wrong, we, there will be consequences for our actions. Sometimes the consequences may come a little later, but they come. So in one sense, Duryodhana is acting in an anti-spiritual way. If he is against his own soul. So Krishna wants even the good of Duryodhana at the level of his soul. And that's why what he's going to do, he's going to stop Duryodhana from doing terrible things. What happens is, sometimes we have bad intentions. Now, of course, you know, can say, many times we have bad intentions. But what happens is, most of the times, our better intelligence prevails and we don't act on those bad intentions. When somebody provokes us, something is just punch that person in the face. But you know, our intelligence, our conscience, our culture, no, I shouldn't do that. Hmm. But sometimes some people are just too short-tempered. So if they are acting very brazenly, say if a small infant gets angry, the infant can just flail their hands and legs. Hmm? If a young man gets angry, 
or they can find a gun and shoot people. If the president of America gets angry, they can nuke an entire country, isn't it? So sometimes to stop people from doing dangerous things, one of the ways is to take away their powers. Then, if the president of America is about to you bomb nuclear, use nuclear weapons against a particular country, then that's not necessary. Then maybe you know, the president has to be impeached and removed. So they have to be sent forward. So that is what Krishna is doing. I mean, is he is stopping Duryodhan? So he's not against Duryodhan. Okay. So, so this is the context. Krishna is not partial towards Arjuna, or he is not biased against Duryodhan. He has a mission for the world, world's benefit, and Arjuna is assisting him, and Duryodhana is obstructing him. And now Krishna is acting in such a way that if Arjuna assists him, Arjuna will be elevated. And if Duryodhana opposes him, Duryodhana will be degraded. So therefore Krishna is neutralizing Duryodhana, so that at least he won't be making things worse for the world and making things worse for himself. So Krishna may not be equal in the sense of being identical, but he is equal in the sense of being effectively equal. Not literal equality, but effective equality. Okay. You had a question or comment? Oh, yeah. um, so couldn't we say like um, like Duryodhan was making Krishna's life easier? Like he was also like assisting Krishna because he was against him. So that way, in war, like they could get rid of all the evil. Like apart from Duryodhana, he's facilitating the destruction of all the other evil people also. Right. So. Uh, and like we have similar examples in like those two uh, people like who grew up like those uh, trees in Krishna's backyard. So, uh, yeah. Okay, that's an interesting question. That is Duryodhan also assisting Krishna, uh, uh, assisting Krishna in his plan? Well, that's where the difference is that is a person uh, intentionally assisting or accidentally assisting. Hmm? It's like somebody is on a battlefield who is trained to fight and they have come there heroically on the battlefield and they are courageously going to the battlefield and maybe throwing grenades in the opposite camp so the enemy will be destroyed. And somebody is just a reckless young man who has got some grenades and just throwing them somewhere. They happen to land in the enemy's camp. <laughs> you know, it's a very different situation. So now Duryodhan Ultimately, it is Krishna's expertise that Krishna can further his plan even through those who have no intention to assist in his plan. But that is Krishna's glory, that is not that person's glory. Hmm? So, such people, because they don't have the intention to serve Krishna, so they don't get the benefit. See, ultimately, all the power, all the ability that we have is not our own. We have it today, we may lose it tomorrow. Hmm? That's how the nature of the world is. Somebody may be in the top of the world at one moment and just a few moments later, that person may just, I don't know, what happened to me? No, if you consider cricket, no, the Kohli was in the top of the cricket world just a few months ago. And now, he doesn't know whether he had a place in the Indian team. No, we have nothing against Kohli, we offer our best wishes to him. The point I'm making is, that our abilities are not our abilities. They are actually abilities given by God to us. So those of you who don't know Kohli, I lament your ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Kohli is a famous Indian cricketer. When I come to America, many of my, especially when I am speaking directly to people who are Americans, many of my hosts will tell me, don't use any cricket examples. <laughs> Because they said, for many Americans, when you use the word cricket, they think of the insect, not the game. <laughs> <laughs> so, and probably in other sports, you know players who were at the top of the world at one time, and then after something else, they are, they are nobodies. So our abilities are not our abilities. So whatever we are able to do, that ability is given to us by God. But what is in our control is not so much our ability as our mentality. So we, so... A Duryodhana's mentality was not a devotional mentality. So um, the other people like uh, Dronacharya and Bhishma Pitama, could we say that they had the positive mentality but were still against him? Well, Mahabharata ethics is complex. 
and they both are in different situations. See what happens is, see there is black and there is white. And most of reality is in the muddled middle, where things are not so clear. So yes, Duryodhana, sorry, Dur now Duryodhana was clearly evil. You know, he had tried to assassinate his cousins, he had even tried to assassinate his own mother, his, 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 you could say, the Pandava's mother, he had tried to disrobe Draupadi, so he was clearly evil. But for Duryodhana and Bhishma, what happened was, in their case, their moral compass got confused. See, when there are, when, see, there is a, how should I put it? See, suppose somebody wants to, wants to get some new phone. And then they go to a shop and they say, hey, this phone, I don't have enough money to buy it. But then they look around and say, hey, in the supermarket, the camera here is broken. So maybe I can just sneak in, put this in my pocket and go away. <laughs> now at that time, we, most people know what is right and what is wrong. And to choose the right, we need moral strength. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there may be two right options or two good values. So if somebody said, I'll always speak the truth. And they have a friend who's being chased by some rioters. And if said, please save me. Because their friend belongs to a particular ethnicity and the rioters want to attack that person. And they hide the person, that, that friend in the basement. And those rioters knock on the door, bang on the door, is he here? Now what should they do with that? There is one value is to speak the truth. The other value is to protect someone's life. So in this case, what should the person do? What do you think? Lie. Sorry? Lie. Yeah, save the person's life. The emphasis is not on lying. The emphasis is on saving the person's life. If saving the person's life requires lying, then do that. So the idea is, but in this case, there are two moral values. And which moral values higher? That is much more difficult. That's why we don't just need values to guide us in our life, we need a framework that places values in a hierarchy. And sometimes some people get the hierarchy wrong. So in the case of Dronacharya and Bhishma, they got their hierarchy wrong. So they place, uh, so the Zen could say this, the cause of dharma below their own personal words or personal obligations. So in that case, so, they, so their ethical count there, they were not evil, hmm? but they were, you could say, uh, they were misled or they miscalculated. Then it was not that they lacked moral strength, but they, their moral intelligence were misfired at that particular. So there's a difference between the two. So one is motivated by greed or evil. The other is just misunderstanding, which is a higher value. Okay, so let me take the last part and then we can have a few questions before you will become liberated. <laughs> so now, in our own lives, when we talk about equality, we may see so many ways and we may see the things differently. In our office, you know, we may work just as hard as someone else and somebody else may get a raise, somebody else may get promoted. And we feel, why is this happening? Sometimes in our family, we may have a sibling and both of us are grown up and you know, we have our family, we have our children, we are doing well in our life. But our parents always seem to appreciate, appreciate the other siblings, they never appreciate us. You know, sometimes it may seem that, that you know, inequality may seem to be there everywhere. So how do we deal with this? So there are two levels. Mm -hmm. There is, one is a practical level and the other is the transcendental or the spiritual level. So the idea is that uh, in our philosophy, the understanding is this world is real. At the same time, there is a reality beyond this world. So this world is real means if there is a problem, uh, then we try to fix it at the level of this world. So if somebody is repeatedly treating us, if, if say we are treated unequally by our boss, then you know, maybe in a polite but uh, polite but firm way, we assert you, we ask. You know, this is my track record. Um, 
why was I not given the raise? And sometimes they will give the straight answer. Sometimes some people prefer good communication. So, we, if we experience an unequal treatment, we can act at a practical level to find out what is the cause. And sometimes it's possible to fix things that way. But sometimes, just some people are biased. Or oh, sometimes we just can't make sense. No. Two people, say two twins, grow up exactly in the same environment, or eat the same food, live in the same, and uh, have very similar habits. And suddenly, one of the friends, one of the twins, gets cancer. Now here, whom do you inquire from also? You go to a doctor, even doctors don't know what is the what is what specifically causes cancer. So sometimes we just see that there is inequality, and there is no practical way to address it. So this is where, so where often atheists ask this question, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? And that is a valid and serious question. But at the same time, it's important to understand that actually when atheists use this argument to say that God doesn't exist, if like there is a good God, why would bad things happen to good people? Well, we could turn it around and question, ask the question, you know, if there is no God, then why should bad things not happen to good people? Isn't it? If there is no God, there is no ordinary principle, then anything can happen to anyone. Isn't it? Bad things may happen to good people, good things may happen to bad people. Everything is by chance. There is no, there is no moral order to the universe if there is no God. So why even ask this question? So we ask this question because we implicitly understand and experience that if we do good, we get good. That is how the world works. No parent, even those pa parents who say, who, who, who may be philosophy professors who say there is no God, there is no morality, no absolute morality, everything is subjective. When they will not tell, teach their children, you know, when you wake up, whether you make your bed or not, it's all the same. You know, whether you brush your teeth or not, it's all the same. Whether you eat your broccoli or whether you eat uh, chocolates, all the same, it's all the same. Nobody trains them like that. Um, we all understand that our actions have consequences and that's how we train and we train those who we love and that's how we act. I've, uh, so the point is that in general we do see that our actions lead to consequences and if we act properly eh, there are good results but there are some times, some, some people may say many times when we act properly, but we don't get the proper results. So it is, but it, it, we could say, it is because we have good things happening to good people, sometimes, that we get the question, why don't they happen all the time? I hope my point is clear over here. We all have experience, say, if our life is very disorganized, and then we start organizing our life, we start managing our time better. You know, some people, they, they are they eat very healthy and there are some people who treat their tongue like a conveyor belt <laughs> <laughs> so anything and everything goes down their tongue now sometimes they may say that they may have a metabolic system that it can digest even in stones uh, but it won't last for very long it will catch up with them eventually but so suppose somebody starts eating healthily it may not be that the health improves miraculously, but does health does improve for the better. So to some extent, we do see that good and good actions lead to good results. So then, when the good actions don't lead to good results, how do we make sense of them? So the point is that, that is where God comes into the picture. That is where we understand that there is a bigger picture over it. There are, there are bigger things happening in my life than what I can understand. One of the fundamental, fundamental virtues on the spiritual path is humility. There are sort of the 20 virtues that comprise wisdom. The first he says is humility. Now humility doesn't just mean when you come in front of the Lord, we fold our hands and we bow down. That is physical humility. But much more important than physical humility is intellectual humility. Intellectual humility means what? It means that 
we don't presume just because things don't make sense to me there is no sense to things intellectual humility means that just because i can't make sense of things therefore things are all senseless intellectual humility means the openness that i don't understand what's happening right now but maybe there's a higher plan let me be open to it what happens is we look at the present and plan the future god looks at the future and plans the present i repeat this you can repeat with me this is we look at the present we look at the present and plan the future and plan the future god looks at the future god looks at the future and plans the present and plans the present so because of this difference in perspectives sometimes we not understand why this is happening but if you understand this principle of effective equality so somebody else may do the same thing as if somebody else gets a raise in their office in their office somebody else gets there some other good thing happens to them and for us it doesn't happen now maybe there is a bigger plan in our life god is effectively equal he may not be literally equal somebody is doing good and they are getting good we are doing good and we are not getting good but that doesn't mean god is biased against us it is we are at different places and if we are doing good and not getting good so you know, that is an opportunity for us to grow in wisdom and devotion because earlier i said knowledge means the capacity to see what our eyes can't see it's very easy to have faith in the fairness of god when we do good and get good is it but when we do good and don't get good that's when our faith is, we have an opportunity to express our faith to exercise our knowledge yeah maybe there are or is a shakespeare saying or tell you that there are bigger things in the universe than what your philosophy can com- uh, comprehend so we all have a particular philosophical worldview but there are bigger things in the universe so when we understand this then what what do we do at the end so i'll conclude with this point that okay, at least we have the intellectual humility maybe something is going on maybe something is going on so how does krishna himself guide you later on in the kurukshetra war what happens is arjuna's son abhimanyu is killed and is killed in a vicious way six warriors attack him simultaneously and they kill him and when arjuna comes back on that day after fighting arjuna has been side tracked uh, by other warriors he is fighting relentlessly all day then he comes back to the camp normally see in those times a battle was like a sports they would fight all day and then at the end of the day no matter how what a tense point the my match is poised so okay, stop now we'll continue play tomorrow so it's like that is more a sporting spirit it's a test of skills and strength so arjuna king i normally when the players come back you know there may be there will be music and some entertainment some relaxation so normally there will be celebratory music in the camp on that day when arjuna came back there was complete silence there was a somber atmosphere and not one of the soldiers or warriors was meeting arjuna's eyes arjuna started feeling a pit in his stomach he had heard during the war so much was happening he had heard somebody call out oh drona is swarming the chakravyu but he had been so busy fighting that he had not paid attention he started thinking thinking that did they form a chakravyu that is true chakravyu is a very complex military formation and one it can trap and overpower any enemy most enemies so only abhimanyu knew how to break out abhimanyu was arjuna's son but abhimanyu knew how to go in he didn't know how to come out so he said his heart started palpitating has anything happened to abhimanyu and then as he came into their tent as soon as he entered his eyes went straight to the throne of abhimanyu all the prominent warriors had their own thrones and he saw abhimanyu's throne was empty his heart stopped in horror he just couldn't accept what his eyes were showing him still not wanting to believe it he looked at his brothers and he saw yudhishthir's tear stained tear stained face 
and its worst fears were materialized. He collapsed on the ground, aghast, and started crying. Yudhishthira had this extremely difficult duty as the eldest brother. He came forward and started explaining to Arjuna what had happened, how a woman had been isolated and trapped and then massacred. And as Arjuna heard this, his grief turned into fury and he latched out at his brothers. He says, are all your weapons just ornaments? Could not one of you protect my brother, my son? What is the use of all of you being such great heroes? So he lambasting his brothers. At that time, Krishna came forward and hugged Arjuna from the side. And Krishna said to Arjuna, O oh Arjuna, in this world, adversities befall everyone, both the good people and the bad people, the wise people and the unwise people. But the difference between the two is that amid adversities, good people act in a way that makes things better. As bad people, unwise people act in ways that make things worse. Oh Arjuna, look at the faces of your brothers. They are grieving Abhimanyu's death just as you are. They love him just as you did. Pray, oh Arjuna, don't speak words that increase their misery. So, it's a signal that we should finish. <laughs> so, the point I'm making is that Krishna, what does he do over here? He tells Arjuna, act in a way that will make things better, not worse. And that is what we can do. Sometimes life seems to be unfair to us. We think even God is unfair to us. God is not effectively unfair, although he seems literally unfair. But at that time, what we can do is, okay, I don't know why this is happening. I don't know how to make sense of this. But let's ask the question, what can I do to make things better? And let me not do the things that will make anything that will make things worse. And if we just ask this question, life may be unfair to us, but we don't have to compound that unfairness by being unfair to ourselves. How can we be unfair to ourselves? Sometimes we may beat ourselves up. You know, maybe maybe I am jinxed. Maybe my destiny is rotten. Maybe I'm never meant to amount to anything in my life. Uh, so no, that's not true. Yeah, everybody goes through bad phases in life. Bad phases will end. But how can I act to make things better, not worse? So the, what the Mahabharata does is that it isn't, the Pandavas were good people and many bad things happened to them. And the Mahabharata doesn't go into too much into previous lives, they did this and they did that and because of that this happened to them. But it focuses on how the Pandavas responded to all the bad things happened, that happened to them. So this, the wisdom texts of the bhakti tradition, they reframe the question. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's an important question. And there is karma and other things to answer that question. But the emphasis of scripture is to reframe the question. Now what, is, what is the reframe question? When bad things happen to good people, what do good people do? What do good people do? They act in a way that makes things better, not worse. So that is ultimately the way we can reciprocate with God. I started by talking about effective equality, which can seem like literal inequality. So when life seems unfair to us, we can see that as an opportunity to go grow up spiritually, to put faith in God. Okay, I don't understand what the situation is or why I'm in this situation, but I understand that God is my well-wisher and He wants me to grow up. And the way I grow up is by trying to act in ways that makes things better. And how can I make things better? 
do we stop being resentful? Instead of seeing it all the ways life has treated me unfairly, just look at some ways in which life has treated me fairly. Some ways life may have treated me more than fairly. Sometimes we have got more good than what we deserve. We all, if you look at our life, we all got some lucky breaks. You know, when some things just fell in place for us. So look at that and be grateful. And try to act and to make things better. And if we act in this way, we will find to our amazement that things will become better. And especially if you do it in a mode of service to God, not only will things become better externally, but we will become better internally. If we act in a way to think, make things better, we'll find that our faith in God will increase. We will have grown wiser. We have, will have grown stronger. We will have grown deeper in our life. And that is life's most enduring pain. That greater wisdom, that greater devotion, that will take us to life's highest destination. That will toughen us to face the toughest challenges that life throws our way. And that will ultimately take us to be united with God, to be with Him for a life of eternal love and eternal joy. That is life's supreme purpose and supreme perfection. So I'll summarize. I spoke broadly three points. First was the idea of, yeah, that theme was how to understand when life or God doesn't seem to be equal to us. So first was equality. It's not literal, but effective. Parents may treat different children differently for equally encouraging them to grow. Then was Krishna partial on the Purukshetra battlefield. Krishna was not taking the side of Arjuna. Rather, Krishna wanted the good of everyone. And Arjuna had taken Krishna's side and Duryodhana had taken the opposite side. And Duryodhana not just taken the side opposite to Krishna, Duryodhana had taken the side opposite to Krishna, his own soul. And to benefit Duryodhana, Krishna neutralized him. So Krishna was equal to both of them. And then in our life, when we see that, feel that life is treating us unfairly, now we can act at a practical level to try to resolve it if we can. Just, uh, just politely but assertively ask and try to get things resolved. But if we can't, then what do we do? If life is unfair, don't be unfair to ourselves by becoming resentful towards the world or towards ourselves. Just change the question. Not why is this bad thing happening to me, but what, what can I do to make things better? And if we act in that way, not only will we make gradually make things better externally, but we will become better internally. And that will be a lasting gain for us. So let's conclude with a small prayer. My dear Lord, you can try to repeat after me. My dear Lord Krishna, please give me the strength to always have faith in you and to maintain a service attitude toward you. Please let me always act in ways to make things better. And avoid acting in ways that make things worse. Shri Krishna Bhagavan Ki, Shri La Prabhupada Ki, Gaura Bhatta Vrinda Ki, Hai Gaura Bhagavan Ki, Hai Okay, yes. Can you get Um so prior to the battle prior to the battle for etc., um when um like whenever they were like choosing like like going to kings to get the permission and stuff like that, whenever three of them went to Balaram or I don't know if this happened is exactly happened, but Balaram essentially was like um, he decided to remain neutral. He didn't take any sides because he didn't think it was fair that, like, the Pandavas were treated this one way and Drew um, was treated another way because Maharaj just participated in the game of dice. So, him, like, I guess essentially, like, why did he actively remain neutral? Like, I guess, I know that he, like, didn't want to fight against Krishna, but he also did come in support of the war, 
yeah that's a tough question you know while balram not support the pandavas directly he in fact balram is also known as duryodhan guru he had trained duryodhan in his fighting see there are okay there are different levels at which something like this can be understood at one level uh, duryodhan was brilliant he was what you can say an evil genius one of my friend is in india here nowadays there is a lot of uh, attraction for subversive analysis subversive analysis means what is the normal understanding just give the opposite understanding and everybody is attracted <laughs> so in i was in south india and there was i said there has you have a program and after one person gave said, i belong to rpc said, what is the rpc the ravana protection committee <laughs> <laughs> So they said actually Ravana was a good person. He just made one mistake in his life, and then all these Brahmins they have spoiled his good name. So I want to restore the good name of Ravana. So they support his analysis. So one of my friends he gave a seminar in a college. Lead learning leadership qualities from Duryodhan. Hmm? So now he said what? He's a terrible person. Well, not so simple. He was expert in his own way. So we often just say we say Duryodhan had how many brothers? Ninety-nine brothers, you know, they are total hundred, and his ninety-nine brothers followed him. You know, if you have one sibling, try to get that sibling to follow you. <laughs> <laughs> It's difficult. So Duryodhana was expert in in you could say what in today's world we call spin doctoring. Hmm? That's how he actually presented his side of the story in such a way that people just believed his side of the story. So what happened was that's how he was able to get eleven of the army soldiers to fight. He was able to form a bigger army. So that at one level we could say that even Balram was affected by that. But that's an external understanding. Balram is God. He's not going to be affected by that. But that's one level of lesson we can learn. That even some just because somebody is bad doesn't mean everybody will automatically understand that they're bad. It's that. If, if they can do good marketing of their cause, even a bad cause can seem to be good. So it's not enough to be good in the world. It's actually important to be seen as good also. We don't want to exhibit our goodness, but we have to be concerned that our virtue is known to them. Otherwise, there will be always people who will malign us. What happened is the Pandavas were in the forest, and because they were isolated from all the other kings, they didn't get time get to tell their story to anyone for for almost thirteen years. That's one side, but the other important point is that Balram often acts in contrary ways to spice Krishna's pastimes. So there's Moksha Lila. Moksha Lila means that sometimes some devotees of Krishna they take on the role of demons that Krishna can have some the excitement of fighting with somebody who is challenged, like Jay and Vijay. They are the doorkeepers of Krishna, but they become these demons. They become. Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu, they become Ravan and Kumbhakarna, they become Shishupal and Antavakra. So we could say Balram takes that contrary role just to spice Krishna's pastimes. So now that Krishna and Balram never fight, but Krishna and Balram have fierce arguments at times. And Balram opposes Krishna, and Krishna responds to it. So that's that's how there is some rasa in that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Sabram. Um, that is uh, inside that thought. Could you say um, that Balaram is God, also Krishna? So that embodies actually this text here. Balaram was uh, equal to all, but then Krishna was partial at the same time to his devotees. Okay, so that wasn't my question. Yeah, but that's, that's good. Good point. So Balaram was equal to all. Well, Balaram, even 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 he had his personal preferences because Balaram trained Duryodhan. He didn't train Bhima. So we can say that. at one level it was not because of duryodhan's qualification that balram trained him it was because of balram's own compassion but sometimes even god can offer compassion to the undeserved but sometimes the undeserved may reciprocate with that sometimes they may not but they may not reciprocate properly with it so it's not so much a matter of fair or unfair over here it's more of god god manifesting in different moods in different manifestations so krishna has a particular mood balram has a particular mood and so they are the same person but they are very different personalities 
and based on their personality, they, they, they have naturally attraction to something. So, personality means individuality. You know, Krishna plays a flute. No, why? He says, is Krishna partial to flute? Why can't play Krishna, Krishna play a harmonium? Well, Krishna can play a harmonium also if he wants. <laughs> but that's a, his person. He has an individual. He has his preference. So he likes a flute. Okay. Yes. My, my actual question was, um, I believe you said that Krishna gives everyone the opportunity to have partiality towards him. Uh, what about the people that don't ever, um, at least in this lifetime, don't get to meet Krishna, or people that are born from Brahmana families? Um, how is that uh, equal opportunity? So those people who don't get the opportunity to turn toward Krishna in this life? Well, it's not necessarily Krishna in a particular like a two-handed flute, flute play manifestation. During the course of human life, everybody comes at some point or the other towards a juncture where they start thinking, is there something higher in life? And at that time, they are at crossroads. They can explore. And if they explore, then the path to Krishna will open for them. But many times people just turn back. Yeah, maybe there is, but it doesn't matter. So, so it's it's a choice. So everybody gets that opportunity, not necessarily directly connected with Krishna. And sometimes to directly connect with Krishna. So what just that to explore high, life's higher side, life higher meaning, higher purpose. Sometime other life brings them to that, but they don't take that opportunity. And at the same time, we can say therefore it's our opportunity, our responsibility to try to give that opportunity to as many people as possible. So we open the door to spirituality for them. We give them a book, we, we act cordially and friendly with them, we invite them for programs, even if they don't come. We maintain a cordial relationship, so whenever they feel inspired, whenever life then brings them to a juncture where they become introspective, spiritually reflective, then our open door will invite them in. Okay, thank you. Maybe last question. Yes, please. Um, you spoke about the equality of Krishna, but in the same verse it also speaks about his partiality. Where he, he says also elsewhere, He asks Arjuna to, to declare that his devotee never perishes. But he has a reciprocity where he treats his devotee differently because they are partial to him. How do we understand this in cases, not only when devotees are materially in difficulty, which, as you said, is his way of giving them growth as well. But how do we understand this in cases where their devotional service itself is in question, where right? devotees may stop practicing, or they may yeah. be in difficulty because of their devotional service? Is that only on their part, or is that something that Krishna is allowing that to happen as well? So if some devotee faces such difficulties, keep switch up. some devotees face such difficulties that they they can't bear it and they stop practicing their bhakti. So then where exactly is Krishna's protection at that time? That's a tough question again. Uh, my understanding is that Krishna's protection can come in multiple forms. And in such situations, quite often it is we who have to manifest Krishna's protection. So if somebody is stopping the practice of bhakti, then we try to become their connection with Krishna. Not just become the guy who are telling you, know, why don't you come to temple, chant some round, come around the chant. No. Just see what difficulties they are in and try to offer support. You know, you, we generally can't guilt people into practicing bhakti. You know, how can you stop chanting around? How can you not do this? You know, Krishna, I just consider the example of human view. I was expecting this question, but maybe all of uh, you, the answer was, in your, all of you know the answer, right? No. If you know Arjuna heard the Bhagavad Gita and Krishna said, Hiras Tatra Namuhyati, a wise person not bewildered by death. Because there's just a change of bodies. Then why was Arjuna so shattered when his own son died? Well, let's first I'll answer that question, but let's first look at Krishna's response. Krishna didn't say, hey, Arjuna, you already forgot the Bhagavad Gita, what I taught in this? How are you so dumb? No, Krishna didn't do that. Why? See, it's because there is a time for philosophical instruction and there is a time for emotional support. So when somebody has lost someone as dear to them as a child, okay, the philosophy is important, but, and the philosophy needs to be remembered, 
but there is a real hurt it's like suppose you know somebody has an accident and they break their hand their hand gets broken in the accident and then they are going home to the they can't lift books and they say i can't lift this bag you know come on prabhu you're not your body <laughs> yeah i'm not my body but this body is the instrument that i have and it is injured isn't it so just like the body can get injured the mind which is our subtle body that can also get wounded and when something or someone very dear to us is lost there is a real emotional wound and at that time that person needs support so just like a person can't lift weight because their hand is fractured at that time there's no point in telling them you are not the body yeah i'll lift it for you so similarly at that time when somebody is going through some difficulties we should be there to offer them support and if we offer them support and they say that yeah they want to help pull for them they will not just see we helping them they will see actually okay these are krishna's devotees who are helping me it is krishna who is helping me through those devotees so that's how we have to become the instruments of protection uh, and when we do that that can strengthen other spirit a lot so rather than judging or guilting people into bhakti we can just try to help them in whatever way we can and yes sometimes they may go sometimes uh, you know people are going through difficulties and they have to process those difficulties on, on their own terms we can help them but they have to process on their own terms so they may need some time to process it so we we have we either we manifest that protection or let the product protection manifest through someone else okay to okay. answer question okay. so thank you very much for your thoughtful questions and for your active participation